Hey everybody, this is Stu Smith with another Two Through and After podcast. We got a special guest, Nick Hayes, former Navy SEAL and now uh, CEO of EliteTeams.com. You got to check that out. Um, but first, we're going to learn a little bit about Nick Hayes and his journey of you know who he was before he joined the military and what he did you know throughout his military career. And then we'll talk about what he's doing now because, uh, you know, be honest with you, everybody kind of likes the story. You know, they like to hear, you know, you were just an average guy out of high school that decided to go crazy and, you know, become a Navy SEAL and take on one of the hardest challenges there is. And then you went on to do some pretty elite educational programs after that. And now you're running, once again, a, an elite team program. So you kind of stuck with that trend. So let's find out a little bit about your journey. Nick and uh, welcome, dude. Thanks for having me, man. I we were talking a little bit off camera, but it's it's a big deal for me. Like you didn't know you were teaching me the combat side stroke, <laughs> but you were. So so many of us, you know, active duty guys now, and then guys who are just transitioning out, um, found so much strength in your words going in there. So that's why you're you beloved, man. In, oh. in well, 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 thank you very much. I, uh, you know, being a famous seal isn't necessarily a good thing, but I, I'm glad that I've been able to be helpful along many people's journey. So, uh, so let's talk about your journey. So who were you, uh, before you were in the military? Yeah. So growing up, I moved every couple of years. So people asked me if I was a military brat, but no, even worse, my, my dad was in retail. So oh. we didn't even have the benefit of, of military orders to stick around right. for, uh, for four years. So we were, we were bouncing around um, mainly Rocky Mountain states. Okay. So coming into junior high, we went south to Tucson, Arizona. Um, it, it was there when the idea, to, when, when I even learned what BUDS was, you know, because back then there weren't as many, as many movies um, as many books, it was kind of a kind of a speakeasy thing. I think. Yeah. Was, what uh, year was that? This was '97 uh, ish. Okay, gotcha. So maybe The Rock was coming right. out. Yeah, yeah. There you know, go. like <laughs> Charlie Sheen so, had a Seal movie that was pretty bad, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was comical. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess moving around, you kind of learn to rely on a couple tips and tricks to break into a new group. Um, I think levity was one of them. I, I was good yeah, at kind of yeah, finding yeah. the humor in things, yeah. lifting people up, um, and, and that worked out pretty well. And then athletics was by far the best way to break in um, to a new context because I played, you know, three seasons growing up. I wasn't great at anything, but I just enjoyed the Same. camaraderie. Yeah. So I, I played football, wrestled, and, uh, and ran track. Wrestling oh, cool. Was- That's what I did. Hey, really? I, I, yeah, cool. I played baseball. I played baseball my first two years, and then we actually – it's a funny story. I don't mean to interrupt yours, but it's a, it's a similar journey. Football was my love. Then I wrestled. The football coach would get all pissed off because I was losing all this weight during wrestling. Right. right. And then I played baseball, which worked out pretty well my first two years. But then they got a powerlifting team my junior year. And I said, wait a second. During wrestling season, instead of wrestling, I can get a letter by lifting weights? Oh, this is, this sounds too good to be true. So I power lifted and that completely screwed up my baseball. So instead of, you know, being a catcher and throwing the ball, I was like, you know, screw this. I'm just going to go do shot put. So I did track <laughs> for my last two years. So great journey. You know, it's a great, those three sports right there are really good for um, building a good foundation for what you are about to endure that you didn't even know. You know, I, I couldn't agree more because for for development, it's it's imperative to have a team sport. You yes. have to know, and that's what I love about football, is like you do your job so your brother can do theirs. Yeah. They do their job so that you can do yours. You can't win the game no. alone. You just can't do it. Yeah. You need everybody. And I was a fullback too. So I just, you know, I was a smash mouth guy. I could lay a hit on somebody, but it's not exactly a finesse position. <laughs> you know? That is true. And then – and then, yeah, my football coach would give me some guff, too, because his, uh, his fullback would drop down to 114 <laughs> to wrestle. That only happened my, my freshman year. But so. And what I love about wrestling is, you know, everything that football is not, when you're wrestling, hey, you put your foot on that line, you shake hands, that whistle blows, no one's coming to help you. 
You it's know, that's you. true. Those combative sports are great for that. And it, it builds a mental toughness that uh, is hard to replicate anywhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got into track. I was running the 3200. So eight laps oh, around man. the track is brutal. Brutal. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know why I did it. Um, but it was, it was good developmentally as well because some of my friends um, that are team guys now were running cross country. And I felt like that prepared them very well for, you know, tactical fitness for the military and what was coming. Um, what I had was similar, not as long. The races weren't mm -hmm. as long, but just the brutality the, of just being on the track and, and what that does to your mind. Mental, to you, yeah. Yeah. You have to go somewhere else. You know, you're replaying the movie diner in your head. <laughs> you, you know, you're using no, that's a really good head. point because, you know, all these sports require you to kind of be in the moment with all your training, but then kind of dissociate from the pain of the training, right? Yeah. And, you know, of those moments. And, and that's a good skill to take into, uh, um, you know, being surf tortured or, you know, right. ride, you know, a boat on your head forever or just, you know, brutal running. You know, that's a really good point. I never really thought of it that way as, uh, you know, almost a, you know, a, a dissociative skill, you know, versus a disorder right you know there you go yeah, yeah. i like that it's it's interesting you probably get into like a phd would love to dissect that right but, exactly yeah you know I, I didn't know i was preparing i, right. I didn't know that same was happening. i was just same. having fun exactly 100 percent. me too and that's you know what when people ask me this all the time hey what should i do to prepare for buds i tell them go play sports and have fun be a kid you know that's what you're supposed to do, you know, you're 16 years old, go be a kid and play some sports. You know, I'm still learn. doing that at 37. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. It's a good way to live. It's a good, yes. way to live. um, kind of jumping back into where athletics turned into preparation, um, for the teams. There were, there were two brothers that both wrestled. Um, this was in Tucson, Arizona, and they had kind of a rough home life. So they, they popped in with, with me, you know, my mom took care of them quite a bit. And uh, it was the older brother's idea. I don't know what really sparked it. Like I said, maybe it was The Rock. Maybe, I don't know. But he was like, hey, we should totally do this thing. I love it. I was afraid of this guy, even though he's like, <laughs> still like a brother. Um, I'd seen him do some damage, man, you know, on, on the wrestling mat. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're doing it. <laughs> but I started <laughs> looking into what it was. And it wasn't being a SEAL that really attracted me because I just didn't, I wasn't there yet. I didn't do all that research. There wasn't sure. much material out either, I think. Right. Like, uh, Marcinka probably had a couple books out at the time, but there yeah. wasn't much. Yeah, mid, um, mid to late 90s, there was not much out there. Yeah. Yeah, but there was a couple books about buds. Um, yeah. Couch, is that Dick Couch, yeah, that's where I started too. Yep. Okay, cool. Dick Couch, yep. Um, I think it was a 2-2 two, two class. Right. Two, two yeah. something that, yes. I remember reading that and I, I was intrigued by this idea of Hell Week. For me, the entire thing started because I learned what this thing was. And I was like, man, that sounds like the ultimate. Because as an athlete, you're constantly taught self-preservation, recovery, healing, um, you know, all these things that are really important. But, I, you know, I'm sure I watched Fight Club at the same time and I was thinking, Hey, what's going to happen if I can go to some type of crucible, some type of selection to where I can say, Hey, strip me down tell I'm nothing but bone and burger. And then let's just see what's left. I just want to know what's left. And that was intoxicating. For me. I agree with you hundred percent. I, I think a lot of people who go there have that. Uh, but a lot of people who go there and make it definitely have that attitude about taking on this challenge taking on this gut check, you know, competing with yourself, competing with others and having that, you know, mentality of just, you know what, I'm just going to go. Just yeah. keep going. Right. Go yeah. till I'm done. Right. I love it. Great. So we, I mean, we started, it's a group think, right? So now there's three of us, a couple other guys join in and, and we're thinking about how we can prepare, how we can, um, start to kind of emulate some of the stuff that we would be doing in, in the Navy. Um, so we got this crazy idea. I don't know why my mother agreed to it, but we got backpacks, filled it full of gallons of water, canned goods, because we have no idea what we're doing. 
<laughs> now we know ounces equal pounds. Back then it was, I don't know, food is better than no food. Um, loaded up our backpacks, went to Mount Limit. So this, this giant mountain outside of Tucson, Arizona, it starts at like 2,600 feet, cruises up to like Colorado mountain height. You nice. Know? It's, it's an amazing mountain. So we got dropped off on the north side, um, which is um, Catalina State Park. And we hiked this trail up Romero Pass and then back down Sabino Canyon. So if anyone knows that area, they know what I'm talking about. It's like 40 miles. Ooh. Yeah, we took three days, two nights to do this, ran out of food um, on day two, went up and over this thing. It was kind of a harrowing story. I actually put it in my book because I thought it was, it was worth mentioning kind of a stand by me moment that rite of passage as a young man, you're in the wilderness. No one's coming to save you. You know, yeah. the only way is forward. Um, and, and we all made it obviously, and nobody gave up and we made it over the mountain. And what's tremendous about that is from that group of friends that committed to do something stupid, uh, <laughs> gut checks like, gut checks man you gotta do you gotta practice doing stuff that sucks that's yes. how you get good at it if you want to get strong you go to the gym if you want to learn how to play guitar you build calluses because that's the only way you can withstand the pressure of the strength we didn't know we were preparing we well we started to kind of key in on it um but what's interesting is is three of us out of that group are all seals oh um, man that's awesome yeah, it's it's you don't hear stories like that. But no, you don't. We went hardcore quick, and we were normal kids. We did, you know. I I'm a little guy. I'm like five five. I I you know, define Smurf. Oh um, yeah, Smurf crew. And that's me, you know. So I, I've had to scrap tooth and nail through everything in my life. Nothing's come easy. Couldn't be any more average. Um, but it's those moments where I, I started tapping into something that was, you know, extraordinary. And, and I had, I always had a really strong group of friends with me, um, that, that made it fun. Oh Kept man, that's awesome. It. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I had the very similar thing. Once I, you know, I made a, a different route. I went to, to the Naval Academy, but you know, the Naval Academy, each class, there's a hundred people in each class that want to go to buds. Right? right. So you got plenty of people to work out with, you know, but then they, they only select 20, right. To go to buds. And then that group becomes really tight. And uh, we worked out together. We pushed each other. We competed with each other. And you know what? All 20 of us made it. We went 20 for 20 that year. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a really, really cool story. And then like eight other guys that didn't get slots out of my class, they, they lateral transferred from surface and then they made it. So, I mean, it was, wow. a, it was a really good group of people um, that made it. But you, you do have to surround yourself with those, those folks. And sometimes you – a lot of the guys that are out there now are doing it themselves. You know, I, I can think of many, many times where I had to do it myself, um, you know, because I didn't have a, a second or third buddy, you know, that also shared my, my goal. So uh, one thing I did was I found a buddy who liked to lift. So I lifted with him. And then I found a buddy who liked to run, who was a better runner than I was. I ran with him. I found a buddy who liked to swim. I swam with him. He was a better swimmer than I was. And then we'd all four go out, you know, that night and go have a good time but I would work out with all three of them that day, you know, in, in my preparation. So you don't necessarily need a guy that's going to do everything with you. Just find a guy that's one thing at a time and, you know, that work on your weakness. And, you know, it sounds like you had a great uh, group to uh, get you to there. So you got to there, you know, I'm sure you have some stories about, you know, your process before buds like delayed entry program and boot camp, and then, you're at buds. So it's up to you how, how you in depth you want to go through those. So what was the journey like, you know, getting through that process? Just getting, yeah, just getting to the Navy with the SEAL contract was, was a real challenge for me. Um, you know, long, long story short is the two brothers went in after, after high school, I went to college because I wanted to, to go to college first and then, and then cruise in. I was still going to go and enlisted because um, I liked my odds of just, you know, getting there and it being my, in, in my hands. Yes. But I wanted to start with that, with that degree. Um, so I went down to Ole Miss. Nice. So um, it was, it was working out until we invaded Iraq in, in March, 2003. And I realized that my brothers were going to go down range without me. And, and that, that really 
scared me. So I, I dropped out of college that day and uh, went down to the recruiter's office and um, joined up, said I want to get in, in there quick. So I love that my story starts as a college dropout. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I go down to the office, I walk in and I tell him, Hey, you know, I want to go to buds. I want to be a seal. And this guy's looking at me, you know, five foot nothing. I pretty much look like, like Frodo Baggins walking in there with freshman 15 saying, Hey, I want to go to buds. So this guy laughs at me. He's like, okay, whatever, buddy. And he gives me a contract and he says, yeah, this is going to be great. This is a great job. You need to be an air crew. And then when you get to the boot camp, then you can say that you want to be a SEAL and they'll let you mm. screen. Um, I, I, I bite. I fall for it. Um, so I, I sign up. I'm, I'm leaving the office on cloud nine and I call my brothers. I'm like, hey, I'll see you soon. Um, and that's when the younger brother told me that, that I'd been done wrong. So, you know, for anyone listening, I don't know how it is now. but It happens. And I just did it the other day. I had a guy that said, you know, he was going to be a something air crew guy and he was going to try to go to SEALs um, and he could try out after a school is what his recruiter told him. Yeah. So I was like, you need to find another recruiter because he's either lying or doesn't know what he's talking about. So it, right. it still happens. So very, very good point. It, it can still happen. So you, that's why you got to do your research out there. You know, everybody, you know, you got to figure it out, you know, because you can get told something and you think it's true. You need to double check, verify it. Absolutely. Well, they got, they got tough fill billets. They got these metrics that they have to meet. Yes. And I mean, they're selling used cars over there. They'll yeah. get you into whatever they need to move. Yeah. So, yeah. and I, but I didn't know that I, I rushed it. I was like, boom, I'm joining the Navy. Um, and then I realized that I'd been done wrong. So I had to learn, I had to do my research. So I start you know, obviously I tell him I want to change. He says, no, I'm not going to give you a change. You signed up. He starts telling me I'm already in the Navy. I signed, I have to go. Yeah, all that's these bullshit powerful. too. That's bullshit. So I started reading all these publications. I realized that I'm not in the Navy until I'm at boot camp, until yep. you show up. And so this guy has no power over me, despite the fact that he's saying he has a power over me. Um, then I actually learned, and here's something I'm not necessarily proud of, but it had to be done. The guy wasn't, uh, wasn't working for me. He was trying to put me in a place that he wanted me, but I knew where I needed to, you know, where I needed to be. So I learned that if I got a fresh tattoo within a certain amount of days before shipping out, that they couldn't send me anyway. So it would make those <laughs> orders null and void. So I went down. But by this point, I actually, I'm in Memphis, right? I'm joining out of Memphis. So I go down to Beale Street and I get my first of many beautiful tattoos. I get a cross on my back and I show back up and I'm like, hey, buddy, let's, let's redo this thing. And. I'll never forget the look in, on his face. He knew that he'd been beat. Nice. It was, it felt good. So I, I said, Hey, here's what I want in my contract. And you're going to do this with my brother on the phone. So now he's talking to a seal, um, writing my orders. Uh, I had to grab, I had to grab it back. Somebody was trying to screw me. I'm like, Nope, this is my life. I'm going where I need to be. I'm not going to let you do this. You know, that's, that's one thing I learned is that like, if you're going somewhere, you know where you want to be. Um, Someone says, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you can't do it with them. Yes. You got to find another way. Yep. I, I learned that lesson quick and I ended up getting to, to buds, but just getting there, man, having, yeah. having to make that play. Um, it's a little better now. They have a much better system, 10 times better than it was. I mean, I'd say for the last 10 years, it's been pretty good. Every now and then you have a recruiter that might not be as informed as others or just full of shit too. But sometimes that, that happens as well. Um, but yeah, uh, 10 times better than it was. So what, um, how was that journey? Everybody who tells me, um, that's a, that's a seal now says that the only time they really thought about quitting was during boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That is, I, I would, I would do buds again before I ever went to boot camp again. And you just don't see it coming. I mean, it's like, it's like a straight right to the face, you know, yeah. because for me, I'd rather be treated like a man. You can run me around, you can do everything else, but treat me like a man, Yeah. you know, put me in there and treat me like, uh, sorry, did, um, no, you're good. Okay. Um, treat me like a child. Oh, that's rough. Um, boot camp was, was legit. It was legit. And yeah. what works on patience, you know, helps your patience. Um, you get good at standing at attention and folding laundry. Right. You know, 
you know. And I understand and, some of that too. I mean, yeah, if you're gonna absolutely. if you're gonna handle gun stuff, you know, it, it pays to start with towel stuff. If you yeah. can't handle the towel, how can you handle a weapon? Very good point. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And I, I'll be honest. I mean, I think that's one of the best things that ever happened to me was boot camp because it was uncomfortable because of how, you know, unnatural that was. In fact, I look at, at some of the young men and women out there that don't have the luxury of a program like that to teach them discipline. Yes. Um, and that's it. That's what they're doing. They're teaching discipline to probably kids that, you know, are somewhat self-motivated, but maybe a little bit undisciplined. Yeah. You know, so that's good. So, so eventually you made it to buds, you know, when was it at buds that y you figured it out, you know, that, that you figured out, you know what, I think I got this. I think that, uh, hell week Monday night was, was the moment for me because you know how the week starts it's Sunday, everybody's fired up. Most fun you'll ever had is breakout. Yeah, that was pretty it's, fun. It's electric. And then yeah. sometime that night, maybe it's steel pier. You realize this can be a long week. Is it? <laughs> this is as advertised. No one lied to me. Um, that is about what, that is yeah. True. But I think on, on Monday night, I'll never forget. The sun was going down. It's, it's melt, melting into the water. We're locking arms, walking out to the surf laying down on our back. Um, they do that on purpose because you know it's about to get rough. But there was a star member of our class. This guy um, was an uh, Olympian pentathlete level athlete, just a star performer, shoe in. You know, this guy is like made for buds. He's made to be a SEAL. And not only that, but he was a really nice guy, just open door policy. Um, you know, he was a pillar of strength for, for the group. I mean, honestly, he's one of those guys that he probably told his parents that he was going to be a SEAL. And they were like, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's, that's <laughs> a logical progression for you. Like, what else? You know, compared to guys like us where it's like, hey, I want to be a SEAL. And people start saying, really? Yeah. I'm really? Are you sure? At school, dentistry, yeah. something. I had to prove so many people wrong. After yeah. They told me I couldn't. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which yeah. was the best part of the whole process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this guy is just an absolute rock star. And I'll never forget laying down in that water Monday nights and going down started to hear murmurs coming down the line, you know, and everybody's talking like, Hey, old boys quitting. Um, this guy had stood up and he was walking down to the bell that was mounted on, on the truck right then. And, and he decides that, that he's done by the time he got to that bell walking down the line, people were looking and they would get up and just quit. It's like they, they, he broke their spirits, you know, you people know what? That's the way it works. Yeah. That's the way it works. You know, when you see somebody that, you think is solid and then they don't make it. It's, it's real easy for you to put in the towel. And it's usually a mass exodus. They know that too. They get one yeah. quitter. They're going to get four or five following them. Yep. Cause it, it gives them a narrative. It gives the people a story and they'd already lost the battle in their mind. They had already quit, but now they're thinking I need a reason. I need something that I can tell people, mm. um, you know, that if he can't do it, I can't, you know, it's those kind of things that, that they were telling themselves. And for him, I was thinking, Hey, what was it that actually broke him? Because it wasn't the physicality. It wasn't anything else. This, this guy was a phenomenal athlete. And I think what got him was the fact that he finally found something that he couldn't outrun or outperform. And that was the cold water, just hmm. sitting there in misery, embracing the suck, the battle of the minds. Yeah. Um, and that's what got him. And I'm sitting there been wanting to do this since I was a young man. You know, the sun's going down, which to me meant a beautiful sunset. I'm finally smelling the smells that I, I imagined when I read the books. I'm, I'm finally locking arms with my future brothers. And Love it. Yeah, I'm making these stories that I'll be able to tell my brothers that are already in the SEAL teams. You know, when do I start hallucinating? When, do, you know, <laughs> I'm so excited about all this. That I was sitting there in a state of thankfulness. I, it, it was so hard to get there. I was so thankful to be there. I was scared to death of not passing the swims, not passing. Um, the times and everything else or something medically happening. Sure. Happen. I was so scared of not meeting the standard that I never thought about quitting. I, I didn't have time for that. I was so thankful that I never had time to be scared. You, you can't be positive and negative at the same time. I and love I think it. sitting there in that thankfulness is the reason why, you know, the surf just didn't break me like it could have. Nice. You know what I did? I, I kind of dissociated. And I didn't really know what I was doing, I, but I just went to a happy place. And I remember saying, you know, we're not going to be in here all night. I remember thinking that. So I was positive. So there's a moment when we're going to get out of here. What am I going to do when I get out of here? 
you know, I'm gonna, you know, this wasn't hell week, but it was like, you know, one of those many nights before hell week where, yeah. you know, you're going to go sleep, you know, that night in your bunk, you know, and you, you know, you're going to get, take a nice warm shower and you're going to eat something and go to bed and be warm and all that. And I just play that over and over in my head. Right. Of like my, my going to bed process while I was just sitting there freezing my ass off. Right. And I just kind of get in that little happy place of like, yeah, I can't wait for that big glass of milk. That's what I want a big glass of milk and, you know, just silly stuff. And then I'd taste it and I'd, you know, smell the, you know, the, the food that I was eating and, you know, I'd just go in all these different senses in my head of, you know, while I was sitting there freezing and uh, I knew it would be over eventually. But uh, during hell week, I didn't have that luxury. You don't have that luxury of it's going to be over soon. And, you know, you just, I would just make it to the next meal. You know, that's a, that's all you can do. I get to sit down in the chow hall eventually, mm -hmm. sit down and eat and put my hands around a warm cup of coffee, right. And yeah. try to get a little bit warm. And I just, I just play that over in my head, you know, and just kind of go to my little happy place. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a way to do it. You know, everybody has their own way. And I love to hear your story on that. That was a great way to look at it because you're right. You know, during hell week, there, there aren't like these, you know, timed runs that you have to pass and time swims you have to pass, you know, it's, it's enduring, it's enduring each event. And, um, and that's, that's what you have to do. And you're right. It's good to be thankful for that. You know, yeah. And it's, it up it's and funny. The, the next meal thing was, was something I did all the time as well as I, and I, I remember our proctor saying something about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I really hung on to that strategy because, you know, b making big things small is something that I had already kind of figured out. Um, like that one hike where we're going o up and over Mount Lemmon, you know, we would break every hour. So, well, every like 45 minutes we break to 15 because it was such a long haul. Um, so I would, I didn't want to hold back my team, you know, so my legs are burning, I'm dying. You know, I would just tell myself like, Hey, I got 20 minutes and we got a 15 minute break. No big deal. So you're not thinking about the summit. Right. You're not thinking about the other side of the mountain and coming down with that's going to be like, you're thinking about the next 20 minutes. That's all I got to do. And then I'm going to sit down and take a break. So, you know, you're sitting there doing log PT. You can say, Hey, next meal. All I got to do is get to that meal. No drama. But when that logs over your head and your shoulders are dying and you're like, or I drop this thing on my head and die. I don't know. You know, yeah. sometimes you got to go even smaller and then yes. all the way down to, Hey, they're working our shoulders right now, but they can't keep working my shoulders. They're going to have to hit legs. Yes. So all I have to do is get to the next muscle group and I can rest my shoulders. Great idea. That's a great way to put it. Cause I will tell you this, uh, 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 something that broke a lot of my classmates hearts was, uh, you know, that log PT, Right. That oh, yeah. first log PT that you're going like five, six hours and then you have, you know, you have a meal. Right. So we're like putting the logs away and we're like thinking, I wonder if this is the last time we're ever going to touch these logs. Right. We start thinking <laughs> like that a little bit. Then <laughs> you go eat, eat, eat a meal. And then sure enough, the next six hours log PT again. I was like, Oh man, that, yeah. that was a breaker. I mean, that, that was a, a mass exodus of classmates right there. We probably lost 10 or 15 right there when they had to grab that log a second time. Oh so. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one reason I love my Smurf crew, man, because we were not, you know, the star performers of the group, you know, it always pays to be a winner. I don't remember it ever paying. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we weren't winning races and everything, but the, the worse it got, the funnier it became. It was just a group of comedians and we had a great time. That's awesome. It was hard to break our will because, hey, we're going to try to win, you know, but, and I think we, we clawed our way to second place a few times and the beatings were just as bad, but it was just funny. I mean, it was, it was a great little band of brothers. I love I it. We lost like a couple guys early on in the week and then we didn't lose anyone else and, and the group was phenomenally tight. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Still friends to this day. Last week I was staying with one of them down in LA, you know. Uh, that's nice. That's so really the Smurf nice. crew helped. Having that little band of brothers throughout my life, you know, when I would move in somewhere new, I'd, I'd make that band of brothers and we stayed tight. Um, to this day, I have friends from, you know, I moved away in third grade, but we're still friends. Right. You know? Yeah. You have and those I bands have throughout oh, yeah. life. Every, every phase you have those bands. You're right. That's really important. You know, yeah. and then that, that, that one means that you're a really good teammate, right? You, you thrive in, in, a, in adversity where a team, is required to get through it, you know, versus just you, 
you right. know, and uh, that, that that's very helpful. And you're probably used to it with all the multiple history that you've had with sports and, you know, older guys that pick on you all the time. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things that it's like, you know, I'm used to negative feedback. You know, I'm used to screwing up a play and getting chewed out for it and, you know, fixing it and then getting the play right the next time, right? So th those are little skills that go – you don't even realize that you're developing when you're a young teenager. But, you know, you're going to receive nothing but negative feedback at Bud's. I mean, it, you gotta you got to be used to that. If you're used to winning everything and never failing, negative feedback to you can get in your head really quickly. And I've seen guys that are like killer athletes have no problem with, you know, anything that's going on at Bud's physically, but then just that little seed that an instructor can plant in your head, like you're the worst officer ever, you know, to ever <laughs> go through here, <laughs> you know, just something like that. And you're like, what? I've never been told that before, you know, and it just, it just eats at you. And the next thing you know, they're, they're gone. You know, it, it can oh, yeah. happen like that big time. It's so true. I, I, I remember, I think it was our last log PT. You know how they'll pull guys aside and try to get in your head, just like what you were talking about. Oh, yeah. You know, plant those seeds. And I'll never forget the moment that happened with me. And he's like, hey, you know, obviously, like, you're kind of holding down your boat crew and this and that. Have you thought about it? I got so mad at the guy. It's like Tuesday night. I'm, like, way too far into this thing. I think you're, like, clinically insane after Wednesday. You yeah, lot, there you go. You, you went out for a second. Sorry. Yeah. What okay. What did you say when you were uh, talking about clinically insane? Yeah, I, I think after Wednesday, you're like clinically insane. So you lose that super ego. That um, is true. That is true. Yeah. So I was already past that point. And I, uh, I I piped up to the guy. I'm like, so I'm like yelling at my log, like, hey, get over here. Get over here. You know, telling him like, hey, tell this guy that I'm not like, yeah, it was, it was just a funny moment. The guy started <laughs> laughing. He's like, get back on your log, dude. Because he knew it wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I, right. I was past that. Right. Um, and, then, and then there's that time where uh, they know they can't hurt you anymore physically, right? They're not, they're not going to do that. Then they get in your head like, hey, Smith, you have a girlfriend? Yeah, I used to have a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they'll say that a couple of deployments and she's gone. You, you know, it, is, it was, right. you know, they, they get in your head like that too. You know, if they, uh, they know they can't beat you down they'll start messing with your head that way so that, that's always a fun little challenge <laughs> so much fun yeah 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 so all right so we we made it through buds and uh you know you go through well i got i, I want to say I, I got rolled multiple times so oh, I, yeah, I, I got rolled. want to sound like a rock star got oh, no, no, no. Drama. <laughs> uh, yeah that, that happens you know being, being rolled is i mean being not rolled is phenomenal you know somebody who can make it through first time every time is pretty impressive and it doesn't happen to a majority of the class like i, I was yeah. rolled with a knee injury third phase like five weeks before graduating and uh that was depressing you know getting rolled that close to to graduating but i was thankful that i was rolled and not booted and uh you know i just had to heal lick my wounds and come back stronger and that's you know it's typically what you have to do you have to lick your wounds yeah. and come back stronger or if it's a you know performance type role you just got to get better you know, fix your deficiencies and come back stronger. Yeah. And I'll tell you, one of the best things that ever happened to me was getting rolled because I know more SEALs now. So now that I'm on the outside, my, you know, the amount of people that I've, I've endured that training with is, 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 is larger. And, and that has been tremendous benefit. So that's a really good point. Yeah. You get a couple classes and your, 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 your group multiplies. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, it's been a really good thing for me. Of course, I had to pay the man for it. So I, I failed uh, one of the last swims and buds by ten seconds. I ended up uh, in performance rolled. It was it was dramatic, and I was getting married because um, I was cocky enough to plan my wedding for immediately after buds. Mm. Um, so instead, what that turned into was rolling back into third phase, flying out to San Antonio, Texas, getting married, and then flying back and going to land nav. So my honeymoon was uh, up at Laguna doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, delayed, postponed honeymoon. Yeah. A little bit delayed, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we ended up going to, I think, Cancun before Benning, before Fort Benning. Nice. So. Nice. Yeah, you know what? I We, we postponed our honeymoon to after a deployment. Yeah, nice. Was, yeah, it was you like. You can enjoy it. I was, uh, yeah. 
So it was just, you know, one of those things. It's one of those things you do. You know, there, there's a there's a uh, commitment and a sacrifice that you make in these jobs. And, you know, thank God that people can do it for 20 years. I only did eight years. Uh, but, you know, 20 plus year career is, is incredible. Um, yeah. Uh, so it, which comes with a lot of commitment and sacrifice. So, you know, if you're thinking about that, realize that there is a commitment and sacrifice to it uh, as well for those of you that are listening. So what happened uh, after that? So you get married, you're, you're off, you're on your way to uh, post buds, you know, uh, training, uh, you know, at your team. Um, how, how did that go for you? What was your journey in the teams? Uh, how, how far did that span? So, yeah, I went out to SDV team one. Okay. Um, that was SDV here. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. You know, I know, I know, I know being wet, <laughs> you know, being wet. Yes. So I cruise out there and I, I become a, a pilot. So, you know, I'm, I'm flying the bird and, and everything's going pretty well. I remember being way too cocky for somebody who hasn't done anything. Right. But I had the, the benefit of a really strong platoon chief. So, you know, my, my first platoon chief was, his name's Jim Boa, um, phenomenal guy. I don't like dropping names unless I ask people first, but he's, he's sure. in the book, you know, right, I, I right. give him as many props as possible. Um, cause he got a hold of me, man. Like I'm the moment, the moment that I decided I was going to be a good team guy and I wasn't going to be a turd uh, or I, I started to define what that is, you know, wh what a good dude looks like. Um, cause you know, in the, in the teams you have a good dude, a good neighbor, and a shit bag. Yeah. So yeah. Three categories. You're good dudes or people that have it, you know, character wise. Um, but they're good operators and have a squared away department. Yeah. You know, your, uh, your good neighbor is the guy who maybe isn't the best shooter, maybe isn't the best, you know, operator, but you trust him. You know, he's somebody that, uh, that has, has some of the, the moral stuff intact and then your shit bag. Well, that's self-explanatory. Sure. And I feel like I was, I could have easily gone down that road. Um, as any new guy, kind of sure. that, that point where you need some mentorship. So <laughs> that moment for me, I, I show up to a, a morning meeting right on time, maybe a minute late, but you know, as a new guy, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. So he, he was like, Hey, stick around after the meeting, man. Um, no worries. Now this was the kind of guy that would never raise his voice. He would lower his voice and speak slower, which was bone chilling. Oh yeah. Yeah. That that's effective. That's effective. Effective. Method. So I, I stay after the meeting. It's nine o'clock. We have a night dive nine o'clock in the morning and we have a night dive that night. So a lot of gear to prep. Um, we're working with some other platforms. And, um, so he tells me, he goes, Hey man, it's not a big deal, but obviously you made everybody late. So give me a favor, grab a rucksack, you know, which is a backpack, right? Grab a backpack and fill it full of 50 pounds and run the Paraloft tower one time for every guy in the platoon. That's five stories. We got 20 plus people in the platoon. Um, I thought he was kidding. That punishment didn't seem to fit the crime. That's, that's quite a day right there. But I said, okay, went downstairs, grab a rucksack, you know, fill it full of 50 pounds. But, but my Wiley chief, Jim, must have seen that coming. He, he follows me down. He's like, Nick, you can't do it right now, man. Like in place of a workout, that's not even a punishment. You got to do it like <laughs> He's like, let's go hit chest. So he invites me to go work out with him. So we're working out, never brings it up, never gives me a hard time. It's in the back of my mind, but still I'm kind of thinking, is this like a character test? Is this, is he just waiting to see how I handle this? I'll play the game, you know? Um, so we go out and we do our dive. I'm, I'm piloting the STV. We recover. It's late, you know, past midnight. And uh, now we have to, you know, do the team gear, decon the team gear get everything good to go. We have our dive rigs. You have to, this is work. This is time. Um, you know, and then finally I'm doing my personal gear and I'm making sure my wetsuit is washed and everything's good to go. Everything's hung up. Now it's like one, one thirty in the morning. Um, this is in Hawaii. I think it was actually raining at the time, like insult to injury. Um, and I decided it's time to get over there to the parallel tower and then hit my punishment. So I grabbed my rucksack and I'm walking over there and I saw something that just, Oh, man, it pissed me off. I see my chief Jimbo is sitting by the staircase, sitting by the door over there, um, you know, watching me walk over. So I'm thinking like, what is he sitting here with a stopwatch? What is he going to like yell at me while I'm doing this thing? Did he not trust me to do it? What, is this an integrity check? Which infuriated me. 
Um, but then as I got closer, I, I saw that he actually had a rucksack of his own sitting next to his feet. So I get up to the door, he throws his rucksack on. He was like, all right, man, you ready? Didn't even say anything. I said, what are you doing? And, and he told me, he said, listen, man, we're in this together. Like, we're going to go, we're going to do some stuff. Your failures are my failures. Your successes are my successes. We are in this together. Damn. And he, and he bolted up the stairs. What a lesson. What a lesson. So me and Jim ran every flight. Um, he never brought it up again. Never gave me a hard time. I mean, we talked about God, family, the rest of it. And, you know, in that moment, what he did was grab a hold of me. It, wa it wasn't about being late. It was about he wanted me to trust him. He grabbed a hold of me and said, hey, we're doing this together. For the rest of that platoon, you know, I made my kit look like his kit. If we're in the water, check. Everything's the same way his is because he has seven deployments. Maybe he's learned a thing or two. And maybe I don't have to learn everything the hard way, which has kind of been my thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Point. Um, yeah, he became my mentor and we made it through, um, some amazing things that we got a national tasking on that deployment. It was phenomenal. Um, and we did that together. I remember praying with him before we went out and, uh, you know, reminiscing about how long that road had been. And, and, you know, we were brothers, man. And that's, that's what a leader does. That's what a yeah. mentor does. And that's what I learned from the SEAL teams is that at any given point, you have to have a mentor and you have to be a mentor simultaneously and it's it's never too early to be a mentor either my my seven-year-old daughter mentors my five-year-old son all the time yeah you know because she knows a thing or two that he doesn't yet um and that's the kind of mentality that i wanted to take into the next phase when i when i got out of the teams and i was i was looking at other things i was in the navy for 10 years and then through training whatever time that is in the teams um as i was transitioning out i said Check. I could have been a turd if I didn't find a mentor in the teams that could steer me, give me course corrections when I needed it and keep me on path. I need to reproduce that on the outside. There you know, you maybe it doesn't look like a team guy. Maybe it does. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I, I did reach out to a couple, a couple team guys that were out there. Like David Rutherford is one of those guys. Yep. Who I just Great had guy. respect for. Yep. Yeah. And, and immediately he starts helping me out, teaching me everything he knows. Um, and then I found some other people, you know, from finance world or from, you know, different worlds that um, I told him, hey, I have a lot to learn. I'm an HR nightmare in the professional space right now. You know, what do I need? What gaps do I need to fill? What, because we all have those things. Like, I know what I know. I know what I don't know. But this whole slew of things that I don't know, I don't know yet. I needed a mentor to identify those things, those blind spots that I didn't see because of my time in the SEAL teams. Right. Well, if it sounds like you, you definitely uh, – found the right one because I don't know too many college dropouts that uh, have a Harvard diploma behind them. You know, so, <laughs> so that, uh, tell me about that journey. How, how did that happen? Yeah. So when I, well, okay. So f first and foremost, when I separated from the teams, I already tried out for a contracting program in the Middle East. Um, that's sure. pretty well known at this point. Right. Right. Um, mobile security type stuff. So, I had uh, screened for that, which was amazing. All special operators, you know, from, you know, Rangers, SEALs, you know, SF, all kinds of Marine, you know, um, force guys, or uh, what are they branded as right now? Are they Raiders now? Well, they, they, have, re they have Recon, but they also have MARSOC, Raiders. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and out of like 34 guys, um, I think 11 of us screen positive for that program it was it was amazing that was all because of the shooting call you know nice the, the shooting call is legit um so i screened positive for that i got out of the navy and then two weeks later i'm contracting in afghanistan which is pretty funny wow <laughs> kind of a nice stepping stone transition there but i had already applied to okay so i finished my undergraduate degree when i was at trade Act. Okay. so i went to the, nice. the training detachment started having babies same girl that I had met in Buds, still nice. married to this day. Love that chick. Same, same here. Congrats. Yeah, nice. That's so yeah. rare. Yeah, yeah. I started dating mine in 1990 and uh, still dating her. So. <laughs> That's a great way to say that. I feel the same way. Um, yeah, I, I met her in uh, 2004, but same story. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, so finished my undergraduate degree, having babies, at Trade, separate from um, 
from the Navy, start contracting, and I got into the University of San Diego School of Business. So I'm doing my, my business school from, they were working with me. So I do like two months in the Middle East and then two months back. Um, nice. And they were working with me through that, which was phenomenal. Um, they, I got some stories there, but, but we'll, we'll breeze past it. All right. Um, at one point, I did have to write a paper after being attacked that, that morning, just being smoked. Um, kind of a cool fusion between the two worlds that I was trying, the line I was straddling. Um, but I, I finished up that program and started doing a lot of public speaking, a lot of consulting. I was fortunate enough to, to work with the Atlanta Falcons on their Super Bowl run, to work with the Miami Heat for three years. Now, there's a good picture. You, you want to, you know. Yeah. I, a tall guy standing next to these mongoloids and teaching them about mental toughness. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. I've been to a couple of uh, professional basketball facilities and worked with those guys. And, uh, I mean, everything's just so much higher. The chairs are bigger. The bathrooms, like, I was washing my hands like this, you know, like way up in, yeah. in my face and, you know, pull-up bars. I couldn't even jump to grab it. I mean, it was like nine feet up. I mean, it was really, Oh, yeah. yeah so that's funny. It's that's awesome. a funny sight. That's a funny. Story. I love that world. Um, started working with a couple, a couple corporations as well, and you know, I realized I was like, man, I want to keep going with this education thing because I, I know a thing or two, but I want to learn how to better frame it. You know, there's things that I, I know, but I, I want to be able to quote a PhD and say, well, here's here's why it works. You know, it's not that it works, but here's why it works. So I wanted to go deeper into the educational process, and that's when I found um, actually the Seal Future Fund, the CEO of the Seal Future Fund. Um, was was talking to me about how this might be a good fit. So he made those introductions, and I forced got my way into Harvard Business School. Nice. <laughs> you know, it starts as, as a college dropout and not even having good grades at the time, and it turns into, you know, honor societies at the University of San Diego and, um, and making it work at Harvard. Um, and I, I think that's because I, I didn't become a good student until my mid-30s. Yeah. Because I didn't understand the value. I, I have to know why. You can't teach me what to think. You have to teach me how to think. Yeah. That's, that's the way my mind works. And as I got into higher levels of education, that's where it went. It stopped being about testing, like bio one, biology 101. You know, that's the hardest class you'll ever take. Right. You get into business school and you start doing case studies and asking, okay, well, here's what this guy did. Um, they had this kind of culture. They switched it with this. You know, here's what's going to happen. What, what would you have done? How, what would you have done different? When you start solving problems. Yeah. That's school, when it gets fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's when it gets fun. Yeah. But you got to get to the higher levels of it to really enjoy it for, for what it is. Um, you know, Harvard humbled me, man. It's one of those things that you were talking about how you wanted to lift with someone who was better at lifting than you. You wanted to run with someone who was better at running than you. Yeah. I like being the, the, the guy in the room that has the most to learn. I, I really enjoy that dynamic. And if I'm not in if that's not the case, then I'm in the wrong room. Yep. I have to change rooms. hundred percent. And that's what Harvard was like. I, I saw what smart looks like. Yeah. It's impressive. I was, I was humbled. And then there were times when, you know, these questions come up in, in your group and you're working through them and it's like, Hey, let's kick this to the guy who, you know, works for an auditing company and this is his wheelhouse. And, and let's just take notes. Let's learn from him. Um, you know, let's kick it to this woman who's in education and let's, let's learn from her. And then there were times that the whole group would kick it towards me. And it was always about, you know, team cohesion, you know, leadership stuff. And they, they would, culture was the big one. They would always kick it to me. And then I would get to, and I would see them taking notes. I'm like, wow, maybe I'm in the right room. Nice. That was a cool moment for me, you know? Yeah. It was a really cool moment because that's one thing that operators do all the time is we undervalue ourselves. We're not good at self-promotion. You know, I have a book coming out. I'm terrible at self-promotion. You know, I, I'm talking about myself is a challenge. It's, it's work. It's uncomfortable, which is one reason I'm doing it is because it intimidates me. So that's a good reason to maybe start doing it. Yeah, I've, I never, like that. Shied, I've never let fear be my, my guidepost. So if I'm comfortable with something, then maybe that's exactly where I need to be. Um, but at the same time, we're not verbose. We don't advertise the nature of our work, right? Um, we believe in the silent professional. And that's one thing that I've really had to take a look at as a guy who's going to be in the public eye, as a guy who's, who has a lot to say. Can I be both silent and professional at the same time? 
And where I've kind of come to the conclusion here is it's, it's not about being silent. Your military service should never mean that you have to relinquish your right to free speech and expression. This is not okay. It's not about being silent. It's about being quiet. It's about being a steward of your words. It's about representing your community well, right? But you don't have to be silent to do that. What you have to do is make sure that you're lifting other people up. It's not about the author. It's about the reader. It's not about the speaker. It's about the listener. It's absolutely hundred percent. I love that. That's a great way to put it because I think a lot of us have that issue. Um, and, and you're, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, to be able to use your, um, resume, you know, to help others and, you know, and to, you know, be in a room with people that are completely different from you, but, you have a respect for them because they have already been to two Ivy league schools and are freaking geniuses, you know, and they have a respect for you because they understand what you've done. You know, you are now that picture of what a seal is to that person. And you're right. And, and it can go back to your very same story of your seal chief in your platoon of you be one of those three, right? You can be one of those three type of seals. You know, you can be, you know, the guy that's super squared away. You can be the guy that's just a great neighbor. Or you can be the shit bag, you know, and, uh, you know, that is where we have to be good. You know, it, you know, like I said, you earn your trident every day and, uh, you, you obviously have continued to do so. So let, let's talk a little bit about it. I'm going to share my screen, uh, so we can talk a little bit about, um, what you are, are doing now. Right, so we're looking at, for instance, the. Uh, sorry, my uh, my screen here is uh, a little screwy. There you go. So this is your book, right? Elite High Performance Lessons and Habits from a Former Navy SEAL, right? Nick Hayes, um, love it. What 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 is this book about, and why is uh, why is it that we need to read this thing? So you know, we were talking about the people who don't have the benefit of having been through boot camp, they lack that structure in their life. There's certain ways that they they're getting their own way and they don't know why. Um, this book is a supplement for those people. This is about adding structure and processes that are going to work in your life. Some of it is about how you organize your friends, how you organize your mind, you know, how you organize your efforts. Um, if you, you have to be the right guy for the job before you had the job. So this is a way to develop yourself into someone who's going to be an asset to your team and not a liability. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And so now which came first, uh, this elite book by, uh, you or your website here, elite team performance. Um, or they kind of go together. They kind of came together. I, I started this company a year and a half ago or so while at the Harvard program um, with another seal that is at the heart. There, there he is right there, uh, Aaron. Um, we were at the program together. And so we, we put this company together. And at the same time, I had just gotten a book deal with Wiley. And okay. Wiley is the company that does all the For Dummies series. Yeah, yeah. And math sure. for Dummies. Yeah. So I figured it would be a great fit for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they kind of went hand in hand. Okay, cool. And you know, the neat thing about too, um, about being an author, especially in the kind of business you're in is, you know, when you write a book, you, you're, you now have some literature behind you and it really helps you promote your business. Like you're not going to make money selling this book, right? You're going to make money because people know you've written a book and they're like, wow, he's written a book. Maybe I should listen to him and as uh, you know, hire him as a consultant, you know, so it, you can use it to leverage your business far more than you can do it by selling individual copies. You know, that that's just a strategy. It's not necessarily the strategy. You know, there are people that sell millions of copies too, but, um, you know, for, for most of us, it's leveraging your other business, your services that you provide, you know, other products that you may provide, 
you know, to help you do that. And uh, it's, a, it's a good way to do it. And it's nothing more than media marketing. It's just a different form of media. You know, we're talking about, you know, print media or digital media. You know, it's no different than social media and, you know, making videos on YouTube and things like that. You know, so it's just another form of advertising. So, right. Congrats. That's, that's one, thanks, man. That, that's one reason I wanted to use some personal story in there as well. Like it's not a memoir, but at the same time, I wanted to infuse a lot of that so that the reader could get to know me a little bit. Like right now, my favorite thing to do, I, I love consulting because you're just problem solving. And sure. it's collaborative. It. Yeah. it is so much fun. But um, speaking, public speaking for me is a way to supplement jumping out of airplanes. You know, can't do that stuff anymore, man. Hurt my back. Got a spinal fusion surgery. Redefined what I can and cannot do. But I can get up on stage and make everybody laugh and make everyone feel empowered. And for me, that's my new why. That's what keeps me going and satisfied. Yeah, I will say this. In fairness, it is a good adrenaline pump, <laughs> you know, to get in front of people and speak. It is. You know, it, 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 it gets you fired up just like you're trying to go through that door. You know, it's adrenaline pump as well, maybe to a different level. But it is very similar. You know, you get that adrenaline going and you know, your body's really ready to go. Your mind's working at 110% and, you know, you feel no pain because you got all that adrenaline in you and you're ready to, ready to go rock the world out, you know, on that stage. So, yeah, I'm so excited for you and your, your new process, you know, that you have, your business that you have, you know, the, uh, you know, the book. You know, I, I really like to talk to a variety of different people that have gone through this journey and see what they're doing now, right? And not only the now, but what's next for you? You know, so what, what, what happens now? You know, let's develop this company, let's sell some books, and then what, what's next for Nick Hayes? Well, next, is, this is a three book series. So uh, Elite Teams is coming. So it'll be, you know, so it's funny when you when you look at teams that function at a really high level, it could be a bobsled team from Switzerland um, against a, a project management team in, in, a, in the tech world. And, and the same principles are going to be true. They're going to yeah, be absolutely. doing the same thing. They're going to be communicating the same way. It's kind of like the laws of physics. You know, if, if you jump off a building in, in the North Pole or the South Pole, you know, you need a wingsuit either way. <laughs> you yeah, need yeah. that parachute <laughs> and it work the exact same way. So um, now I'm putting that together um, while at the same time growing, growing the business. So that's what's next. And then, you know, for me personally, I'll be transitioning from, I live in Northern California. So I'll be transitioning from, from skiing to getting on the lake and water skiing, spending time on the boat. So I got three kids, man. We're having a good time. Love nice. My life. Yeah, we're just enjoying this ride. And people can find you on uh, on Instagram. Where Nick Hayes? What, yeah, what is the best place for people to find you? Yeah, at Nick Hayes Life on on Instagram is definitely the best way to find me. And then my company is EliteTeams.com. Okay. And obviously, the book is called Elite. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Apple Books, pretty much anywhere that sells books. And I recorded the audio book. Oh, nice. I did it myself. Yeah, that's, that's intense. It was fun. I have uh, yet to do that. I have yet to do that. I, have it, I don't know how to do that. I was maybe yelling at the, at the microphone saying, do your push-ups. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Ten push-ups, go. You would crush, uh, man. You have the voice. You have your pace. <laughs> yeah, you would crush. You need to do it. But I knew the audio book was going to be a big deal. You know, like to promote the book, I'm mainly doing podcasts. Yes. Um, you know, that's definitely my, my demographic and, and where it needs to be. So the audio book is going to be co-released with, with the print on, on May 29th. So okay, really great. Excited. Getting excited. Okay, great. So uh, this book is not released yet, the one that we just showed, The Elite? Uh, yep, available for pre-order. Um, and then it, it comes out on, on the 29th of, of May. So. Okay, awesome. So that's perfect timing. I didn't even realize that. That worked out real well. So yeah, cool. sure did. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely look at you for, uh, you know, on your website, but also on your Instagram, Nick Hayes Life, right? And we'll, we'll find some, you know, updates on that so we don't forget at the end of the month your book's available. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to check that out and uh, see what's next for you. Yeah, and congratulations, by the way. That's one hell of a story. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that, man. And, and like I said, you know, being – 
thing on here with you is is awesome. I know you don't like that little celebrity <laughs> status that you have, but man, it's real, and you should be proud of that. You well, know, thank you, you. Built a platform based on helping people get where they need to be, and I think that's man the truest form of purpose. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. I it is a passion. I will I will say that. So it sounds like you have found yours um, throughout all phases. So uh, once again, congrats, and you know, for for those of you who are listening. You know, it, it, you do, you have to find that why, you know, so go out and figure out what it was, you know, whether it is having to play three sports to figure it out or, you know, joining the military and maybe even changing military branches, you know, the people do that too, you know, before they actually find out what their purpose is, right? And you go to school and you, know, you might have to go to school a second time, you know, and finish it up and, you know, get a master's degree and, you know, go to Harvard Business School, whatever that is, you know, be a doctor, lawyer. You know, whatever your passion is, find it. And that's really what these two through and afters are for. And thank you for going on this journey with me because, uh, you know, people need to hear journeys like yours. Right? Well, you know, it's, yeah, if, if you look at my resume, it looks amazing. There's all these bullet points that are, have shock value, but, you know, it takes a conversation like this to, to realize how many failures there were between every single one of those bullet points, how many setbacks, how it wasn't out of the box. This wasn't preordained. It wasn't just going to happen. And had I shot a stop short on any one of those eventual bullet points, man, that stopping short, that failure would have become the bullet point. Even if I would have left it off my resume, that would have been in my mind, you know, and that's what's important, man, is you just got to keep moving forward. You have to take one more step. You cannot stop because you're writing that resume. You're writing those bullet points. The world isn't happening to you. You're happening to it. And I think that's the biggest takeaway for a guy like me who's way too short dropped out of college. None of this stuff should have happened. Couldn't swim to save my life, even with the help of Stu Smith. <laughs> but at the end of the day, man, I just kept charging. So it worked out. So there, that's the story, man. That's, that's true for relationships. That's true for professional endeavors. And that's true for finding your, your individual purpose. Yeah, man. I love it. You know what? Th that is a beautiful way to end this story. And uh, Nick Hayes, I appreciate you being on with me. And thank you for those who are listening, sticking around this long. Make sure you check out Nick Hayes uh, at EliteTeams.com. Uh, also, uh, Nick Hayes Life on Instagram. And you can find him you know, on uh, Amazon as well as uh, BarnesandNoble.com for, uh, for his book. So please give that a read. And I'm, you, know, you saw what Nick Hayes was. You know, I, I'm looking forward to reading your book. <laughs> Thanks, brother. All right. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.